Okay, Brad Frost, let's play a game. All right. I got a scenario for you. Okay. You're driving in in the truck. You're driving through public land, still dark, okay. early, well before birds are flying down, and you're prospecting. You got an idea where you want to stop and listen. You pull off the road, and you hear a bird gobble 200 yards off the road. Right. What are you doing after that? Welcome to the Challenge Podcast, brought to you by Raider Concealment. Depending on what's surrounding me. If, am I in the field? I'm in the timber. We'll assume that in, if we're in Georgia. We're in timber. I'm in timber. Okay. What I'm going to do is get as close as I can, probably walk 100 yards and stop and listen again. Hopefully get another bearing, get him to hopefully he'll gobble on his own. If not, I'm going to try to make him gobble, you know, out who, okay. whatever. Um, if he's, I know he's still a hundred plus yards away. If it's thick enough, I'm going to slowly ease in, ease in, try to get within 75 yards of him. If I think I can without spooking him. while he's still on the roost, while he's still on the roost and it's still dark. Now right. if it's already getting daylight and he can see me, I'll probably sit down and just do a little tree yelp. Just keep listening, not call too much or too loud. Hopefully he'll gobble at me and then, you know, just play it cool from there. I hope he'll come in. But you need to make sure you set up somewhere where you think, okay, I can cover where I think he's going to come. Right. I've got a clear open 20, 40 yard uh, shot here. That even though that'll be hard in the dark, you know how thick it right. looks with a headlamp. Well, and that's the thing too, is it starts getting lighter. If he's, he's going to probably stay on the roost for a while. So if you feel like you can, you try to reposition yourself. Right. But the main thing is, I think, is get in there, get set up, get him to call to you, get him to gobble at you. And at that point, for the most part, just every so often give him a little something just so you know you're there. You don't want to call too much and get him just strutting on the limb and get all the hens around there. They're right. going to take him the other way. Right. So basically, I just want to get as close as I can safely and then just do a little tree talk and show patience. I yeah. mean, if you guys sit there an hour or two, when he flies down and you listen for a while, you can tell if he's coming or going or staying still. Give him some time. Don't just jump up and run. Yeah. You know, you give it an hour and he's in the same spot strut and you can figure he's got hens with him. You make him swing around, go way around it, come in from a different angle. Yeah. But at that point, it's just about patience, mostly just a little call. Yeah. What about you? What would, what would you do? Well, uh, first thing I'd do would be pull out my own X map. And I'm going to try to figure out if I can pinpoint, you know, close where he's at. And That's if a there's point. a creek there. I'm going to try to figure out which side of the creek he's on. Yeah. And if possible, I'm going to try to get on the other side of him because I think he'll probably rather go away from that public road where he's probably getting called at a lot. Yeah. And he that may push him away right there. Don't know that. And and I'm going to try to get around the back side of him and do pretty much exactly what you said. If I can get around there before it gets dark or before it starts getting daylight, Still in the dark, good cover. I'm going in with, you know, a green light and I'm barely using it. I got it pointed down because obviously turkeys can see color, right? But I'm trying to get in there as close as I can, but I'm going slow and I'm listening because mm -hmm. he may have hens and I don't want to spook them either. Right. But if I can get around and determine that there should be no obstruction from me, hopefully I guessed he was on the right side of the creek. Now, if he's on my side of the creek already, I'm probably just going to try to swing around one side or the other instead of going directly to him. Right. That way, if he is on the other side of the creek and he does come down either side, I can still shoot across the creek, assuming that's all still public land, right? Right. So I just want to give him a little bit of a different angle. That way, hopefully, I'm calling to him at a different angle than which most guys would maybe stand there at the truck and try to get him to right. answer. From the road. From the road. Yeah. He's probably heard that a hundred times already, depending on how late it is in the season. Now, early in the season, I might do exactly what you did. Opening day, right to him. But these birds, pea brain, they're still pretty smart. So in a nutshell, I'm going to try to give them a different angle, come into where most guys wouldn't, and get within 75 yards of him. Well, you know, one thing, too, about you sitting on public land different is the more you call, the more he gobbles, the more anybody else is going to right. come hunt him. Here they come. Right. If you don't call and get him once or twice to gobble, then hopefully, you know, he'll come into you and nobody else is going to cut you off or spook him or right. whatever else. 
Now, private land, we're probably playing that a whole lot different. Right. And, right. you know, I don't care how much he gobbles because nobody should be over there hunting with us. Right. right. I think great tactics, two hunters, two different ways of doing it. I think either one could kill a bird. I hope so. Hey guys, Brad Frost from the Challenge Outdoor Podcast, and we're excited to announce we're going to be giving away this Crystal Pistol Pot Call made by Pistol Creek. This signature series call is valued at $69, and we're going to be giving away once we reach 500 subscribers to our YouTube channel, so make sure you go and subscribe today. Exciting times, Brad. Man, I'm thrilled with the new setup here, trying to something a little different. Almost makes me feel like we're contestants on the $20,000 pyramid, so uh, here's our first subject turkey tour go well see uh we're gonna be heading out in a couple of weeks gonna go to several different states and you know we're gonna come across a lot of different scenarios for turkey hunting obviously we're gonna be hunting different subspecies which is you know each one's got their own little quirks go start off in kansas with our good friends out there and man we have had some awesome hunts out there with those guys well you know normally we would start out with just scouting a farm with our own x app you know just kind of pull it up look at the terrain, see what we're going to be dealing with. And for me, as far as turkeys go, you know, I'm looking for something that's that for a roost tree, basically. Right. So I know when I start to set up or start to look at a farm, I'm going to start there and then I'm going to get out there and start verifying what I think might be a good spot for turkeys to roost. Now, obviously, if we can get there, roll in there in the afternoon where we got a chance to try to roost some birds, we'll get in a location where we think they might roost fairly close to them hopefully maybe we can get a gobble and then we got a starting point but you know for me it's looking for those roost trees i don't know how you go about a property you know when you're just starting out in the dark but what are you looking for well you know locally here it's so thick that we're we grew up turkey hunting here and you know you, you if you don't have a roost tree you're just sitting in the woods i mean right. you yeah. can't see anything yeah, you know, I remember the first time we went out to Kansas, man. We go out there and they have those wide open fields, and we're used to maybe hearing one or two gobbles in the morning. And we're sitting out there, and it starts getting daylight, and they just started hammering all around us. I mean, I bet there was twenty-five or thirty gobblers. They gobbled three or four hundred times in about ten minutes, and we we're looking at each other, smiling, saying, "Man, I feel like I'm in Jurassic Park." Yeah. But as you know, the problem with that is if you're not close, they go out in the middle of those fields with their hens. And they're four or five hundred yards away. I mean, you can see them, you can call to them, but they're not leaving the hills. Well, what we the problem we had that time is, we thought a bird or two would come in this way, and then there'd be one pop in behind us, and we'd try to swing on that bird, and we end up spooking it. So you're right. I mean, those those field birds in Kansas, it takes a little bit of different strategy. You know, a decoy can work, but at the same time, when he gets out there a certain distance and he just hangs up because he's like, if you can't walk 40, 50 yards to me, I, I'm not coming any closer. So that, you know, those strategies out there, you need to know when to use a, a decoy and when not to use a decoy. And a lot of that is just kind of reading the turkey's body language. The first time you go out and, and set up a decoy, if you get a negative response to it, it's probably time to maybe go without a decoy and maybe get in the timber and have those birds come in looking for you. They don't know exactly where you are. And it, to me, a, a decoy can work against you almost as well as it can work for you. Well, I totally agree, you know, and we found that out many times. We Sometimes it works like a champ and they come in and do exactly what you think they're supposed to do. They strut, they drum, they beat up the decoy, they breathe the decoy. And then, I don't know how many times we've seen them come running in, look around and see that decoy and they just take off at a dead run, yeah. you know. What I think works the best what, over the years we've been hunting out there is if you know where they're roosting, you can get close. I think you put your decoy out. You try to get right. them to fly down as close to you as possible. That's worked great for us. But if it gets on up in the day a little bit yeah. and they're out there with those hens, I think we get over into, into the timber. Yeah. And like you said, just no decoy, just call and try to make them come looking for you. Right. If you have a guy set up a little bit back right. into the woods, and he may come to the edge of the woods and look into the timber trying to find you, but he may not even really go in there, but you're still close enough for a shot, especially with those CVAs, you know, with a 12 gauge. I'm sitting here looking at a beautiful bird, Misty shot, three or four years ago. That was cool, wasn't it? And we were late season, and we just had negative effects, negative responses to a decoy. Yep. And it got down, I mean, we could have shot a few jakes, you know, there was a, a bearded hen, you know, all legal, but she wanted a big tom. For her first bird. Yeah. I mean, I'm sitting here looking at an inch and a half spurs, and oh, I mean, it, it, it was it was as big as a bird I shot. It's a 12-inch beard. I mean, it's beautiful. 
But I told her that last afternoon, I said, you know what? Everything I would kind of normally do, we're not going to do. We're not putting a decoy out. You know, we're not going to call that much. Just very sporadic, you know. And we we weren't there maybe an hour, and she spotted the bird. And we, I knew that we ran a blind because she, she needed to be able to move around and everything. And, and holding that heavy gun for her wasn't easy. So I knew right. we needed to be in a blind. But we had an, a neat little situation where we kind of had a burn out in front of us yeah. about 15, 20 yards. It's cost us a few turkeys, especially with a bow. They can get down there and hide. Yep. So I knew I could potentially sound like a bird on this side of the burn, depending on if, if where he came in. I said a fuel bucket. Uh, yeah. The fuel bucket. Blind. Fuel barrel blind. Yeah. yeah. So it wasn't long that turkey came out and no decoys. He still couldn't see anything where he normally probably would have hung up out there yeah. the way they had been reacting to the decoys. Well, he came in close enough so he could see over that burn and it gave her a shot. And I, I don't think if normally we set those decoys up on that burn, so we got like a 20 yard shot with our bow. I think that would have been negative on this trip. It was so late in the season and a little bit of hunting pressure. They just had a negative response to the decoys. But I want to get back to, you know, we're first walking out there on a, on a new piece of ground. And if you're lucky enough, like you said, to roost a bird, you're in the game. But if you're not, you've, roost, you've uh, done your scouting on, right. on X you found water, I think, is the next biggest thing. And along the water, you're going to find most of the time roost trees. Right, especially in somewhere like Kansas where there's a lot of agriculture and stuff. What I like to do is if I can come in just a little ways and be up high, Yeah. Um, you can call and you can listen. You don't even have to call a lot. Just if you listen most of the time, like in Kansas, they just sound off on their own. Owl a train hoops. goes by or owls or occasionally we'll call a little bit, you know, owl hoot or a crow call. But once you can hear them, then you ease in as quick as you can while it's still cover of darkness, so to speak, and get as close as you can comfortably. But especially starting off, I don't want to spook them. Right. So I sometimes I'll err a little bit on the caution. I'll take, you know, maybe get, but once, like you said, if I've got it roosted already, I'm getting in there super early, an hour or more before daylight. I'm getting in and get situated, and I'm just waiting on them to sound off and do a little tree yell. Maybe you're fly down with your hat and then shut up and let them come in because I think a lot of people we like hearing ourselves call and we call too loud and too much oh absolutely now we love there, hearing them gobble that's right but you know in Kansas too and some of the other places it's really windy so on up in the day sometimes you got to get that box call out or even a paddle call and just really reach out and hit them but you know so it's good to have you know we love the pot calls from Pistol Creek for that tree talking you know, the box calls for later on, and if you really got to crank it up and get that paddle call. But, yeah, first thing, I just want to try to find out where they're at, get as close as I can, get a good setup, make sure you've got good cover. And you may have to sit there three or four hours, wait till those hens go off. Yeah. And then that bird may He's not going to forget again. about it. He's you. not going to forget. Just give them a little bit of calling every so often. Just let them know you're still there. Yeah. Well, I think all those are great points. Uh, you know, we had a hunt similar to that in Ohio last year, but it, it happened the last day. Yeah. We, we end up having a bird coming in in the afternoon. An afternoon can be a great time to kill a turkey. He may not put on the show that he would yeah, in the morning. You're not getting the goblin most of the time. But we were set up based off of what we had found early in the hunt. You know, yeah. we heard two birds gobbling in the, that one vantage point, like you said, up high in the afternoon. And uh, we had one to the right and one out in front of us. One on the right ended up being on private land, so we had the public land out in front of us and hunted a, a bunch of public land and never even struck a bird. I mean, yeah, they were, you know, one of them things you should have been here last week, you right, know. Right. So we weren't. We got our work, our walking in that. Oh, day, yeah, we definitely out. got some, some walking <laughs> in. So we ended up striking a bird. I mean, I think you even said it, it ain't gonna happen, you know. We were already planning on, okay, we'll get up tomorrow morning or whatever that we're, we're <laughs> Right. Home. Actually, we're going to leave that, get up and leave the next morning. So the bird gobbles, and you think, man, he's got a long way to come to get here before dark. And we, we stood up to start moving that way, and he gobbled again, and we realized he's coming. Yeah. And we've just been sitting there throwing out some random calls, not really getting hot and heavy. Well, the bird goes behind us and roost. And I look at you then, I was like, man, we can't leave a roosted bird. You, know, I could we, see, you could I could see, see him. him on the limb. Right. got some footage of it, actually. So that played out perfect for the next morning. We just left the decoys set up yeah. right where they were. 
had our spot already cleared out. I think we left our vest and stuff Everything in there. Except for the gun and camera. Right. And on the way out, I remember marking on the on X. You know, we walked out to the decoys, yeah. marked the decoys, went out to another little spot, 50 yards away, marked that. So when we come back in the next morning, once we got off that, that trail of whatever it was, an old fire break, we had pins dropped all the yeah, way in there. I was glad there. you did because that's only the second day we'd ever been on that property, so we didn't know it. Right. So if it hadn't been for that in the dark, we never would have found our spot. Yeah, we ended up almost tripping over the decoys. Whoa, there goes my chair. <laughs> and I didn't realize. You got short like me. I didn't realize we were that close to it. And uh, lo and behold, we get in there, plenty of daylight, and we get set up. And I remember talking to you about my fear of that bird pitching down because he had a steep, steep, you know, I guess a ravine, sort of. Mm -hmm. I mean, it was steep, turkeys could walk down it. But my fear was he was going to land just on the back side of that hill and strut there yeah, and, and just wait for us. To, you know, we might see his tail feather or something. So we had Chase come in and get down the hill below us. I yeah. think we split off at the decoys. <laughs> and I was going to do a fly down cackle. And then after I did the fly down cackle, he was to wait a few minutes and then he was to pick up. So given the illusion that that bird was, that hen was leaving. So he would have to come up to try to call her back, even though he was roosted with what, six or eight hens? Several. Yeah. He walked right by us and he wasn't strutting. So low light, we couldn't tell which was the gobbler and I had to pass him. But I mean, that bird flew down and just like we thought on the backside of that hillside. And he just, the more Chase called, he just kept drifting up the hill until we could see him and film him and get a shot, and it worked out great. But you know, basically that's elk hunting strategy applied to turkey hunting, yeah. which they're very similar other than the animal, of course. But the strategy there was totally different than while we hunt in Kansas. You know, going out to Ohio, we thought it was going to be farm fields. Right. It was just it was North Georgia and up and down. I mean, it just shocked us, but we had, had to adapt. It took us a few days, yeah. but once we found that bird, we could come up with a strategy and it worked just like we planned it. And of course, a lot of times it don't, but in that case, yeah, that was a good call on your part to ask him to go down the hill and call the bird past us and it yeah. worked out perfectly. I think that bird was roosted within 150 yards, 100 or 50 yards of where we marked him on the onyx the first day. Yeah. But we gave up on the spot because he sounded pretty good ways off. But, you know, so that, those are some tactics there when you're going to hunt new ground and you know we're going to kansas we already talked about that we'll be hunting some farms that we've hunted before and we know some things that have worked in the past right. so definitely we're, we're not going to walk away from that but we're going to be out there a little bit earlier than what we normally are so we may have to feel the birds out and see, see you know they may be the really stages. hinned up you know right so that's going to be one challenge figuring out the, the stage that they are in the breeding season and then from there, if, if all goes well, we're, we're heading over to Colorado, hunting a, a different species, hunting, going from an Eastern to a Merriam's. Yep. And uh, they, they like to gobble a lot. And uh, that's probably going to be a little bit of both. It's going to be some timber and some open, I wouldn't right. call them pastures, but meadows, right. just kind of like you're hunting elk, you know. It's kind of a combination of two. I mean, part of it, like you said, is you're hunting hills and you got ravines and all of that. And you can get a high ground and listen out but you are going to have those meadows and hunt more like you do Kansas. So, you know, it's over the years when we've been doing this for what? I've been doing it for 40 something years already. Turkey hunting. I'm not that old. No, you're not. <laughs> but you know, we've over the years, we've learned a few tricks and we still learn something every day though. I mean, every time I go out in the Turkey woods, more times than not, I'm humbled, you know, realize yeah. how much I don't know. You know, fortunately you don't have to be an awesome Turkey caller to kill a Turkey. Cause right. if it was, I never would kill yeah, one. Neither one I'm horrible. But if you got that cadence down and you know what to do when and mostly when to be quiet and how loud to call, you know, just learning all that based on what the birds are doing, what the weather is doing, you know, the, the situation as far as timber are open, you know, it just takes practice. But the more you're out there, the quicker you learn. I think patience kills more birds Absolutely. than anything. I mean, you make a few calls. I mean, like you said, most guys over call. So as long as you know that you get one response back, I mean, you, you give him a tree yelp or a lost hen or assembly, anything that he responds back to, you can pretty he much shut up because he, he, he knows you're there. Yeah. And you start going crazy with it just because you like to hear him gobble. He's going to sit over there and gobble all day That's until right. you come to him. And what's going to happen more times than not, you can't go to him. He's right. going to see you. He's going to end up calling in another hen. Well, he's got what he wants now. He's going to leave. So when we get to Colorado, 
it's going to be kind of the same strategies. I'm going to be looking at the on X map, trying to find some creek drainages. And most of the time birds want to roost around water, especially here where we live in the Southeast. Yep. They want to find water. I don't know what it is about that security where they think that they, I mean, they'll, they'll fly up over water in a swamp. And I don't know if they feel like that gives them security from anything coming up the tree at them. I mean, who knows what a bird with a brain that big thinks, but I do know they, they like being around water to roost. And then just like we saw in Ohio, when those birds went to roost, basically all they did was run off a ridge and they weren't right. much more than eye level above us. No. I mean, they, they probably elevated just a little, I mean, a turkey's a big bird. It takes a lot of running for get him right. off the ground, you know? You say that, but then we spook them and they're like quail <laughs> sometimes. But I've, I've also noticed that when they like to pitch down, it's just a little easy pitch, boom. Right. And they, they just easy pitch in the backside of that hillside Knowing that, that was my, my concern on that Ohio hunt, was he was just gonna pitch down right there and wait for us to come to him. But we counteracted that plan, so I think that worked out. So I think one thing in Colorado we're gonna to have to be ready to do is walk. Oh yeah, gotta be in shape. I mean, I'm already starting to walk some, carry the vest, and you know, of course we've been hunting here in Georgia for well, a couple of weeks now, and some of that can be pretty hilly. And you know, carrying a camera and a gun and your, your vest, no, I mean, you're carrying 20, 30 pounds. Yeah, you get acclimated. Yeah, but it, it's going to suck the first day or two, no doubt. But the scenery, will help, <laughs> the scenery will help offset it because it's going to be beautiful. And it's exciting to me because this is a piece of ground we've never hunted, right. never been to. Yeah. So you don't have, you know, it's the excitement. I mean, in Kansas, we've hunted so long. We're excited because we know what's going to happen. There we're well, what to, should happen. What should happen. But we're excited about what it may be. We, we may not hear a bird, but more than likely, when, in that high, thin air, you're going to hear them. It's just getting to them in yeah. time and, and not us old guys passing out from lack of oxygen while we're up there. Well, well, you know me probably better than anything or anybody when it comes to hunting. I love new ground. Yep. I love hunting new ground. I mean, even in Kansas, I've told you before, I get tired of hunting the same blind over and over and over. I mean, it's hard not to because it works. I'm, I mean, we've killed what, six out of eight years in that same blind, so it's hard not to keep doing the same thing. But it's going to be exciting, like you said, just going to new ground and trying to figure out that puzzle. Yeah, and, and within a few days. Right, point. and that's the thing. We don't have what, three, weeks. Four days. Yeah, I mean, years. here in Georgia, we could go to the WMA. You know, we got all season to figure it out. Right. But out there, you know, we got we got three or four days, and then we're doing Wyoming. So right. that's another challenging part of it. You know, you, you got to – what gun are you going to grab? You going to grab that 410, that well, CVA, that new year, 410, or are you going to grab that – that old trusted 12 gauge. Well, I promise you, I'm taking both on this trip. Um, that 12 gauge, we know we've, you talked about Misty earlier, me and you both, we've killed birds. We don't plant it, but we've killed them out to 60 yards with those 12 gauge CVAs. This year we got those new 410s, so the whole object now is to be getting close to 30 yards or so. And uh, so it's gonna make it a little tougher, but you know, the name of the show is the challenge. So right. that's another challenge It's the weapon you use. and. I'm kind of excited because it's something different. And in Colorado, that gun's going to be a whole lot lighter oh, yeah. than that 12 gauge. That may that may determine, that may determine <laughs> which gun you carry more so than the, exactly than, than how far you can shoot. So after we leave there, we we drive up to Wyoming, and again still hunting Marion's with Brantonella oh, and with Rangeland friends. hunting yeah. adventures. So it, it's kind of strange the way this trip unfolds. You know, we're hunting ground that some of it we've hunted before. We're always kind of gaining access in Kansas to new pieces, whether it be public land or maybe another farmer says, you shoot all them three-toed SOBs yeah, you want, you know. So that's kind of a do-it-yourself hunt, acquiring our own ground and everything. Even though it may be public, it may be, you know, farm on private ground. And then going to Colorado, this is an outfitter that invited us up. He's big with the NWTF, but he's just going to kind of set us free on there. And I'm thinking so we're going to property lines. They have fun. Right. And I don't know if it's uh, some of the land that he personally leases out or if it's a combination of, you know, some of that BLM it's land. Public and private. Right. Public, so, yeah. you know, we'll find that out when we get there. But then when we go hunt with Brant, you know, he's paid money to these landowners to have the rights to hunt. And, right. you know, they still run cattle on it and, or horses or whatever they may do. But he gains ground for us to go hunt, but he don't do any calling. No, he shows you where it is and he'll take you and right. he'll, he'll pick you up and he'll feed you. But You still got to figure it out. You still yep. got to get out there and scout it. And look. I mean, 
some places he's been to where he can glass and say there's there was turkeys here a week ago you know i've yeah. seen them and there was a couple of good gobblers whatever but the, for the most part it's driving us out there and you know he may wait on us he may not and we got to figure it out ourselves well you know in wyoming the main way most people hunt is with a yeah. 22 250 shooting them at 400 yards like oh turkey boom <laughs> okay we got meat that they're not you know we've educated brant between joe drake and and us and about taking him down to how Florida. Southerners hunt, you know, calling them in close and all that. You know, before that, they didn't worry about if they get them to gobble or strut or nothing. It was just killing a turkey. Now that he's kind of got the bug, you know, he got him a bird down in Florida and he's got him one in Georgia now. So, yeah. Um, so now know, they I also, think, I think he's kind of getting into that a little bit. Yeah. Well, he's seeing, you know, what he's got there you know right. he's got a, a lot of birds there he's got a great deal i think it's what 11 uh, 10, 10 50, 50 for three, for three food and food and lodging and lots mean, of birds for a merriams yeah you know Which so that's a great deal up. so I, i'm looking forward to that plus you know being out there with brant and ellen it's that's always the reason we time. go is to hang out with yeah. our friends that's just a reason to go out there and, and usually that time of year we're hitting on some i mean we could get snow and wind i mean we've been out there where it's just been brutal but snowstorms the, the crazy thing about out there, you know, we look at the weather forecast and the day we get there, the day after, it's going to be miserable. And we roll in there and Brant's like, we need to go hunt. We wanted to kind of relax. We, we just drove like hours. 28, right. <laughs> and sometimes we drive straight out there and we start there and work our way back. So we've been driving a while. We want to take a break. But I remember several times, I think we need to hunt. And lo and behold, we go out there and kill more, de or more turkeys on the nastiest days we're out there then okay we got the good good weather coming in now we already got a bird down each you know or one of us has got one down we're thinking man it's gonna be on fire now and it just it goes to crickets out there yeah i mean you may you'll still see a few birds and all but it's still it's not the same and you know it's been so nasty a lot of the times you can't hardly even hear it you can see them gobbling you can't even hear it because the right. wind and the sleep their tail feathers blowing down they can't even yeah. strut i mean i can remember one or two times we've been out there and it's been like you know, six, eight inches of snow coming. Birds are so used to it, though, it doesn't matter. It's just whether or not you're willing to get out and go do it. And so, you know, that's another thing. We talk about the name of the show's the challenge. Well, guess what else is? The weather. That's yeah. a big challenge, you know. Uh, hiking those hills in Colorado, that's a challenge. So, you know. I mean, you can you can pass on those if you know you got three or four days of bad weather. You can pass on that because and, and, you're going to be there five days. But do you want to put... All that pressure on those last two days, I mean, I mean, I think if you got enough clothes and can man up, you get out there and start hunting. Well, that's the one thing you need on trips like this. We're going to have to pack for 80s yeah. to zero. <laughs> and, and that means a, a lot of clothing yeah, and, you know, you're, you're almost borderline taking a trailer. I yeah. mean, with three, you know, David's going with us. And uh, with everything going on in the world right now, he says he was going to do two tri uh, two states and then fly back. I talked to him a few days ago. He's like, there won't Man, be no flying back. I'm if, staying the if I'm going, out good for us. Right. We'd love to have him. You know, we got more people rotate on the camera and all. But so we'll get to hunt more because there's another guy with a tag. But, man, it's coming up fast. I'm looking forward to it. I am, too. You know, it, it's a highlight of our spring. I mean, we look forward as soon as deer season's over. That's the thing we're planning on is turkey season. And. It's getting here a lot quicker than we, you know, you're prepared for. But uh, we got the gun sighted in. We got them ready to roll, and you know everything's lined up. And I, I'm excited, man. It's going to be some new challenges between the new land, the new guns, the weather. But it's always a lot of fun. And if nothing else, we're going to have some good time. Yeah. Hang out with some good people and uh, see some beautiful country. Well, you know, we talked about a few strategies. You know, when you're approaching new land, you know where we like to start. But all that can change, you know. Oh, yeah. If you don't you find, adapt. if you don't find that water, those those roost trees, you know, they may not be roosting on the property that you're on. So then you got to look for the sign, you know, scratching, a lot of uh, turkey droppings. scat and droppings yeah. and a little J shaped, yeah. you know. Now you got gobblers look for tracks and all that. So that's a different part of the game that we'll get into on, a, on another talk here. But uh, I'm looking forward to it. It's gonna be fun hunting three different states, traveling through the country is, uh, you know, that's always a pleasure seeing, you know, different states and, and what they got to offer and everything. Still got to make our way to Nebraska though, because man, there's a, like a turkey yeah, in we'll every be field. we through there again going, man, we don't yeah. stay here. Hey, Who knows? We may. I'm be able to do it this time. We may end up doing it, it's but I'm good. looking forward to it. So it's about time to get the truck packed and uh, we'll be on the road before you know it. Hey 
Hey guys, Brad Frost from Raider Concealment, and I'd like to encourage everyone to subscribe to our YouTube channel. Make sure you hit the like button, and also ring the notification bell so that you'll get all the updates for our upcoming videos.